Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us in this uh, second lecture of uh, this uh, third year of the Open Science Seminar at the University of Basel, part of the Reproducibility Initiative mm -hmm. and uh, together with the Swiss Reproducibility Network. Today, uh, we are here with uh, Efrat Shimran. She is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences uh, at UC Berkeley working with Professor Michi Lustig. Her research focuses uh, on developing machine learning techniques for MRI, focusing on dynamic body imaging. She had previously obtained a PhD from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, where she developed compressed sensing techniques for rapid MRI. Efrat was recently named as a rising star in electrical engineering and computer sciences, congratulations, and her work on identifying data crimes in medical AI algorithms received international awards as well as wide media coverage. Efrat, just a uh, note so. from my side, uh, she is uh, uh, a very esteemed colleague. We've worked together uh, in the reproducibility study group for a while, and I'm really happy that uh, you accepted to uh, talk here. We are really honored that you woke up so early also to talk to us. Thank you, Efrat. My pleasure. Thank you for helping me wake up early. <laughs> so for giving me a reason, a reason. So thank you for the wonderful introduction, Francisco. And uh, I'm very happy to be here and meet everybody. Thank you all for joining. Um, I look forward to having a discussion with all of you. Uh, so let's get started without further ado. And I hope uh, that we'll have really interactive discussion. So let me know if you have questions or ideas anytime. So let me uh, start sharing. Okay, can you see this? Let me play the presentation. Okay. Yep. Great. So uh, the topic of my talk is data crimes, machine learning bias arising from naive use of open access data. And I know that this course is focused around reproducibility and open science and so on. And so today we'll talk about uh, the benefits, but also the caveats of using data that is found out there and is available to everybody in our own research pipelines. What can happen if we use it in the wrong way? So let me start by giving you a brief introduction into medical imaging and especially MRI, which is my field of research and also I know Francesco's field of research. And so and some of you may be familiar with it. So in general photography, as you all know, when we take a photo with a camera, all the pixels are taken together simultaneously. They're all photographed at the same time. This is not the case in medical imaging. In medical imaging, in order to see what's going on inside the human body, we usually transmit some sort of source of energy into the body. And then we detect a signal that is emitted from the body or, or we detect X-rays uh, that go through the body. And that way or another, we have a detector and we sample measurements. And from these measurements, we need to uh, reconstruct or reproduce an image that shows us the actual body, right? We, we don't simply take a... a, a a photo with a camera. And so therefore what happens is that we need algorithms which are called image reconstruction algorithms that take these measurements and decode an image from them. And today we'll be talking a lot about these image reconstruction algorithms, how uh, to develop them using machine learning and how the data that we use to develop them influences the final outcome of this process. So in MRI, uh, MRI first is a wonderful imaging modality. Uh, it provides really superb quality images of the human body. It also provides many different contrasts. So you can image the body and you can get a whole spectrum of images from the same slice in the same body using different MRI parameters. MRI is a wonderful modality, but uh, it's, it's a downside is the long acquisition time. So let's talk about that. So in MRI, what we do is we sample the Fourier domain, which is known as k-space. So from now on, I will talk a lot about k-space. You'll hear me uh, saying that. So whenever I say k-space, please remember that this relates to the Fourier domain of the image. And if we have an image, then of course, its k-space can simply be obtained by applying the inverse, not the inverse, sorry, the forward Fourier transform to it. However, in MRI, what we get, uh, what we measure is not the image itself, but measurements in the Fourier domain. And if we, if we measure them using the a rate that is dictated by the Shannon-Nyquist sampling theorem, then this gives us a great image, but the, the problem is that this takes quite a long time because the data is acquired in a pixel-by-pixel -pixel manner, as you can see here. 
So in contrast to you, con conventional photography, we just go pixel after pixel in case space. And due to hardware, hardware limitations, this can take quite a long time. For example, several minutes per one image. And so that leads to the main downside of MRI, which is the long scan time. So if any of you ever had an X-ray uh, um, exam or a CT exam, you know that it takes just a few seconds, right? Maybe 10 seconds, that's it. But an MRI exam usually takes anywhere between half an hour to a full hour per patient. And that really happens due to the low sampling rate. So what, what does that uh, lead to? This leads to some of the main limitations of MRI, which are the low machine throughput, which means usually one person per, per hour or two persons per hour, not more. And patient discomfort, because people need to lie inside the MRI scanner for a long time uh, without moving. However, because all of us move, because we breathe, you know, we need to breathe during this long time, then this creates motion artifacts. And you can think of an image, if you take an image, let's say with a camera and you do a long ex exposure where the shadow is open for several seconds or even a minute, then any motion in the picture will be blurred, right? And the same thing happens with MRI. People move during the scan while the data is being acquired and this leads to motion artifacts and uh, severe motion artifacts could, could completely fail the scan. And uh, this is a uh, super problematic in uh, uh, children because children move all the time, especially babies. You can just ask them not to move for half an hour. And so there's a need for anesthesia in pediatric MRI. Usually uh, children are given full anesthesia or deep anesthesia just for the exam. So you can see that there are quite a lot uh, of limitations related to the fact that the scan time is long. And so therefore, uh, uh, there is a strong motivation uh, in developing techniques for accelerating the MRI scan time. And this field has been an active field of research over the last three or four decades now. So what are the main approaches for accelerating an MRI scans? There are, there are uh, hardware approaches using multi-coil arrays. I'm not going to talk about them today because our focus is more on the reconstruction side, but I just want you to know that there are such approaches. And uh, usually nowadays, these approaches uh, that focus on the hardware are combined with undersampling techniques. So what does undersampling mean? It means that instead of sampling all the pixels in case space, we sample only some of them, like here in this example. However, if we then take these, me these measurements and we try to reconstruct an image from them using the inverse Fourier transform like here, then we will get an image, uh, an image that has high aliasing. And this aliasing appears due to violation of the shannon nyquist sampling theorem. So basically, uh, sub nyquist samplings, sampling gives us uh, a lot of aliasing. Here's another approach for undersampling the data. You can see that the samples uh, are distributed more randomly across the K space. And this leads to a different type of uh, image issues, which is called incoherent aliasing in this case. And so, of course, no doctor will agree to work with such an image, right? This is not acceptable at all, and it does, has no diagnostic value. So what we need, given that we want to undersample the data, is image reconstruction algorithms that will reconstruct images from the undersampled measurements, <clears throat> excuse me, like here. And so this is a field of active research, and there are many, many algorithms that have been developed for example, parallel imaging algorithms, compressed sensing techniques, and more recently, machine learning algorithms. All of these approaches are very useful for solving what we call the reconstruction problem. This is an inverse problem where you take an underdetermined system of equations and you need to recover the image that is uh, there in the data beneath all this uh, aliasing uh, and artifacts. This is called an inverse problem. Okay, so now I want to talk about how these algorithms are developed. How do we really go about and start developing such a new algorithm, given that we want the, uh, the result of the algorithm to be accurate? So this is a very common research pipeline. You will find this in numerous papers. Many studies are built in this way. The pipeline begins from the scanner and from a fully sampled case space data. Why do we need the fully sampled data? The reason is that we're going to uh, apply our algorithm to undersample data, but we also want to compare the reconstruction with the gold standard image. And the gold standard image is obtained from the fully sampled case space data. So in other words, what we do is that we take the full case space, we undersample it retrospectively, right? We have all the data, we simply throw away some of it. Then we apply our reconstruction algorithm to the undersampled data. We get a reconstructed image, and we compare it with a gold standard image. This one is obtained from the fully sampled case space using the IFFT. 
And the comparison is performed using uh, image quality metrics that are ver very well known, such as the normalized root mean square error and structural similarity index and others. So this pipeline is standard and you will see it in many, many papers. However, what's the problem with that? If the pipeline is used in this way, there is no problem. But today in the deep learning era, people need thousands of examples for training algorithms, right? You need 3,000, 10,000 examples. And because MRI scans are not only long, but also very expensive, it is very difficult to acquire such a large amount of data in-house. So what people do is they go online, they find some MRI database, they download it and they use it for the pipeline. <clears throat> What's the problem with that? The problem is now that many databases do not offer raw case-based data. They offer images, MR images, not case-based data. So what people do, they say, hey, I found this database. It contains MR images. Um, this looks good. I'll just download the image and apply the forward for transform to it, right? Well, OK, almost. Now what they have is synthesized case-based data. It's not raw data anymore. And this is an important point because when we analyzed papers and we reviewed papers here in Berkeley, we noticed that this pipeline, which now relies on synthesized case-based data, is problematic. That's because many online databases actually offer data that was already pre-processed by hidden pre-processing uh, pipelines. This is not case-based data anymore. This is the case piece of a pre-processed image. And the pre-processing is often applied by the people who prepare the database. That's usually other people, maybe in another country that could happen some years before the research is actually done. And the details of the hidden pre-processing pipelines are not always disclosed on the database website. And, and more importantly, they're not always considered in the research. So people assume that they have raw case-based data here, but it's not really raw case-based data. It's synthesized case-based over a pre-processed image. Now, why does that happen? It happens because there are many, many, many databases out there. Here's an example for a few of them. Of them. Some of these databases, like the ones here on the, on the left, do offer raw case-based data. And this raw case-based data is very suitable for development of a construction algorithm. So using these databases is no problem, that's great. But these are very few. There are many other databases that offer MRI data for different tasks. For example, um, <clears throat> the Human Column Tom Project, the UK Biobank, which offers 50,000 images and so on. Now these databases are offered for downstream tasks. Like the downstream means that after you got the image, you do some pre-processing or post-processing steps, sorry, in order to get diagnostic measurements or diagnostic value or biomarkers out of that. So what are examples for downstream tasks? Let's say, for example, a tumor segmentation or disease classification or biomarker extraction and so on. Now, all of these tasks are very important and these databases are great for research of those tasks. But since they're post-processing tasks, the data was already pre-processed. So pre-processing is OK for this type of tasks, but it's not OK for the development of reconstruction algorithms because the algorithms are assumed, uh, assumed that the data is raw case-based data. However, this is very confusing. You see, there are many databases, and a lot of people are now joining the field. You know, there's a lot of excitement going on about machine learning and AI and all of that. And since many people are not aware of this subtle difference, what they do is they just go to Google, they, you know, they Google MRI data, they find something, they download it, and they use it. So with this research, we're trying to highlight the problem. And uh, why is it important? Because we found that using such databases that offer processed data actually leads to good results. And these results are biased and overly optimistic. So surprisingly, if you download a database that was proposed for another task, not your task, another task, and you run your task on it, you will get fantastic results. Isn't that wonderful, right? It's wonderful, but it's not true. These results are misleading. They're basically too good to be true. And that's what we show here, and that's what I'm going to show you today. How using pre-processed data for development of reconstruction algorithms can lead to biased, overly optimistic results. So we talked about the fact that people download some databases that they found out there, and then they use them for development of reconstruction algorithms. And what I told you and what I'm going to show you in this talk is that this leads to biased, overly optimistic results. 
Now we are all in academia and what do people do when they get fantastic results? And remember, they don't know that these results are biased. They just get them and the results look excellent. So what do they do? They go and publish them, right? Because that's what we want to do. We, we want to publish papers. And so when we reviewed papers, we noticed that there are more and more papers coming out that actually show biased results. And this, be, this is because both the authors and the reviewers don't understand that using pre-processed data leads to inserts bias into the re research pipeline and leads to overly optimistic results. And so in order to highlight and to raise awareness to this growing problem, we coined the term data crimes, which refers to publication of algorithmic results obtained for pre-processed data without addressing or reporting the pre-processing. Now, what does that mean? Let's go back for a second. It means that if somebody used pre-processed data for their research and did not report that in the paper, then this is what we call a data crime because then we cannot evaluate the paper in the right context. And why is that important? Because sometimes you read papers and you will see it when you go into your research field. And some papers show results that are fantastic and much, much better than other papers. And you compare these two and you just don't understand this algorithm look, looks much better, like 10 times better, right? And so you say, okay, if I need to choose a method for my research I'm, and I have these two options, I'm going to choose this one, right? Because the, the algorithm produced much better results than the other one. However, if the other one was uh, done, was evaluated in the right way using raw data and this one was evaluated in pre-processed data and actually shows biased results, then using it is not going to get you very far. And so what we saw is that sometimes people try and use some algorithm and reproduce it. And that happened in our lab too, where we spent months and months trying to reproduce results that were published in a well-known paper. And that we just couldn't get them. We couldn't get anywhere close to them. And the, we, we didn't understand why. And the reason was that the paper was based on pre-processed data while our work used raw data. So what this causes is confusion in the research field. And this is holding back the field because it's not clear which work, well, which algorithms really advance the field and which algorithms just show, show nice results, but on data that is not uh, very suitable for the, for the task. And so one point that we're trying to convey through this work is that you can simply uh, compare papers and say, oh, this has a one NRMC and this has a lower NRMC and just take the, the better one. You have to be very careful and look deep down into the details and examine which data they used and how was the algorithm evaluated in order to really see what is the benefit of the method or of the approach that you're uh, uh, looking at or reading or reviewing. So data crimes refers to publication of algorithmic results where the pre-processing is simply ignored. However, in some cases, it is impossible to get raw case based data. And we'll talk about that later. For example, that happens in dynamic MRI data scans where the, the image changes very quickly and you cannot acquire all the data. So sometimes people need to deploy or to evaluate their algorithms using pre-processed data. And in that case, what we recommend is simply to describe exactly the pre-processing steps then it is very well known what exactly what was done and how you can uh, reproduce or not reproduce these results. But if these steps are simply ignored, then that's a problem. Okay, so today I'm going to show you two pipelines and how they lead to biased results. Both of these pipelines are very typical of data that you can find in public online databases. The first pipeline, which is shown here, is implemented inside commercial MRI scanners. So this is uh, true for uh, MRI scanners of Philips, GE, and um, Siemens, and so on. So if you go and you run a scan in your own institution and you get an image from the scanner, it is very likely that this pipeline was implemented on your scanner. Okay, so what's going on in this pipeline? Here's an overview of the details. So the scanner acquires raw case based data, often using a multi-coil array. And then the scanner itself applies zero padding to the data. Zero padding means that we add zeros in case space around the data that was acquired. Then, uh, and importantly, this is done by default. Remember, by default, by the scanner itself. And we'll get back to this point. Then the scanner applies the inverse discrete Fourier transform to get the images from the data. And then because we have the multi-coil data, which was acquired from a, a, an array of coils, an array of coils means an array of antennas. And then the scanner applies some form of coil combination, you, uh, often using the root sum of squares operation. So what we have now, the output of this pipeline is, the, is, a, a, is an image. This is the image of the scanner. However, this is not the original image. This image is interpolated because of the zero padding. 
And it's also magnitude only. So the MRI data, I didn't say it in the beginning, but any person who works with MRI knows this. The MRI data is complex valued. Every number is complex. It has a real part and an imaginary part. And very often we work with these complex valued numbers. However, after this pipeline is applied, the image that we get has only magnitude values, only real values. And this happens due to the root sum of squares operation. So this image has already been pre-processed by this pipeline. Because this image is a legitimate output of the scanner, it is often stored in online databases because that's what the scanner produced, right? So that's the image. But then sometime later, somebody downloads the data and they don't know that the data was pre-processed. But here, but here you can see examples for two images or several case based data that we downloaded for, from my online databases. And you can see evidence for zero padding. You see all these squares, the, the black shades, it shows that the data has been uh, zero padded to some extent. Now that's okay for downstream tasks, but not for MRI reconstruction. So this is just to show you that this type of data is prevalent uh, in public databases. And now what happens, somebody downloads the data, they take the MRI image, and they apply the forward for a transform to get case-based data. What's the problem with that? As you can see here, now they have artificial data that appears outside the zero padded areas. Why does that happen? It happens due to uh, the combined effect of this pipeline. But all the values here are nothing. They're simply synthetic noise. This is not real data. But people are not aware of that. So what they what they do, they go and they apply a subsampling mask to the entire case space area because case space looks full. They don't know that it was zero by. Now that's the first problem. And the second problem is that today we use variable density masks. Variable density means that the center is sampled much more closely, densely, sorry, than the periphery. You see all these uh, samples are uh, centered around the case space center. But the problem is that the original case space data also lies in the case space center, as you can see here. What this means is that the retrospective subsampling actually samples the original data much more densely than the entire case space. So somebody can say that they undersampled case space with an acceleration factor of 10. Well, actually, it may be closer to two because they sampled the original data very densely. And the undersampling applies mainly for the synthetic noise, which is not important anyway. So because they're not aware of that, people go and uh, develop such uh, reconstruction algorithms based on such data. And then they get the reconstructed images and they get fantastic results. Now, in order to show you the problem with this uh, retrospective subsampling, I performed this experiment where I generated undersampling masks for three different case space sizes and three different random uh, undersampling schemes. So let me walk you through these slides. Slide. So this is the non-zero padded case space. This is uh, the real size of the case space. This is the two-fold zero padded case space. And this is a three-fold zero padded case space. This is the default in many scanners. And now I generated masks using random uniform sampling, as you can see here, weak variable density and strong variable density. So you see, as we go from top to bottom, the samples are more centered around the center. Now, all these masks, masks, all these nine masks have exactly 17% sampling, which means an acceleration factor of six. The only difference is the uh, way the samples are distributed in space. See? And then I went and I measured the effective sampling weight, which is the sampling weight only for the original case space data, which is shown here in yellow boxes. And then finally, I plotted the effective sampling weight versus the zero padding extent. And now let's look at the results. For random uniform sampling, which is shown here on the top row, the, the rate is very uh, constant, and this is what we expect from random uniform uh, distributions. However, random uniform sampling is rarely used in our field uh, it, because the energy of the case space samples is localized around case space center, variable density masks are much more uh, common. And for variable, variable density masks here in blue and in red, you can see the problem. The more the data is zero padded, the, the higher the effective rate is, you see? So somebody can go and say that they, they had a subsampling mask that samples only 17% of case space. Well, actually they could be something 40% and maybe even 55% of case space. Now, any algorithm that is given access to 55 or 40% of the measurements is going to do very well. I guarantee you, you can go and you can check it in your home, in your laptop with your own algorithm. 
give the algorithm access to 40% of the measurement, it will produce fantastic results. And that's why the results that people see are biased, because they actually give the algorithm a lot of samples from the true case space data without understanding that. Now, importantly, this is the default case. So we all need to keep it in mind. If you take an image from your own scanner or from an online database that offers processed data, not raw case space data, you are already here because many scanners apply twofold zero padding by default. Remember I told you that? By default. And so this is not a good idea to go and just naively use images. You have to be very careful about what you're doing. Any questions about this slide or about the last few slides? I think we can uh, maybe discuss in the, end. in the end, yes. Okay, so let me move on. All right, so now after we talked about how the data is prepared, let's uh, look at some results. And over here, you can see an image from the FastMRI database. This is a new image. Now, uh, what I did in this research in order to show the effect of the data pre-processing was to take a raw case space data from the FastMRI database, which offer, offers a few thousands of examples. And then I processed the data. And by controlling the pre-processing, I could show the, its effect. I could show what happens when you use the original raw case space data uh, uh, versus what happens if you use processed data. And then I went and I uh, implemented and uh, not implemented by uh, trend and tested three very well-known algorithms, compressed sensing, dictionary learning, and deep learning. You can see the citations here. All of them are super well-known in our field. And now I could compare their performance using processed and non-processed case-based data. So let's look at the results. What you see here is again a knee image, and this is a pathology from the FastMRI database. You see there's a pathology here. This is uh, indicative of a torn meniscus. Now here on the left-hand side, all the three algorithms were implemented to the, to the original data, the raw case space data. And you can see that the pathology is quite blurred. This is not a very good uh, result, right? But then when the same algorithms were implemented to a two-fold zero padded data, which was already pre-processed, you can see that the pathology became sharper. And this happens because these algorithms now have access to more case space data. This is the crime that we're talking about implementing algorithms to process data. And now, so this is one example. And now let's look at some statistical results. And uh, in order to show uh, the, the statistics and what really happens with this data, what I did was to optimize uh, every algorithm for every different pre-processing step or ratio. So what I did was to take the FastMRI database and prepare four other versions of it. Each version was pre-processed to a different extent. And you can see it here from left to right. This is the non-processed version, and this is uh, with a uh, 1.50 padding, and this is 2.40 padding. So the pre-processing increases from left to right. And then I optimized every algorithm for every database, and I trained and tested it. And then I measured the error versus the pre-processing extent. So what you see here is the error versus the pre-processing, and you see the same trend for all these graphs, the same result. The error reduces artificially with the pre-processing, you see? The more the data is pre-processed, the, 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 the lower the error is. This is the bias that I'm talking about, you see? So if somebody goes and deploys their algorithms to pre-process data, they can get results that are up to 38% better than results of another paper that used raw data, which is the correct way to use the data. 38% better, that's a lot, right? It's not one or 2%, this is a huge bias. And so when you read papers and you say, hey, this paper got much better results than the other paper, check the details very carefully. You may be looking at this instead of this. But many people are not aware of that. So we're trying to raise awareness to this problem. So these graphs show the first data crime. And again, they show the same thing. You say that the lower, the more the data is pre-processed, the better the performance becomes of the algorithm. But this performance is overly optimistic. It is biased and it is not true. Now, let me show you a second pipeline. Uh, in this pipeline, the data is JPEG compressed before it is stored in the database, because you know that big databases often require a lot of memory. So what people do is to apply JPEG compression to them before the images are stored online. And you can see it here. So now somebody goes and downloads a, a database of JPEG compressed images, and they apply the forward for a transform to them, and they get case space. Now, what's wrong with that? What's the problem with this case space? It looks fine, right? It doesn't look zero-padded. So what's the problem? 
The problem is that this is not the raw case space. The data is already sparse here. The data has been compressed, or in other words, sparsified by the JPEG algorithm. Now, today, many algorithms use uh, sparsity priors, especially compressed sensing, but also machine learning techniques. And because such algorithms assume that the data is sparse, if the data has already been sparsified by the algorithm, then this day makes the inverse problem easier to solve. Or in other words, the algorithm needs to make less effort in order to solve the problem because somebody did some of the work for, for that algorithm. And then the same pipeline is deployed again. So now uh, let's look at some results. The over here on the left, you see a knee data, a knee MRI, a, a, a knee MRI image, sorry, from the fast MRI database. And what you see here on the top are the gold standard images for four different compression levels. So here there's no compression. This is the default JP compression with a quality factor of 75. And these are two very high compression levels. So these are the compressed images. These are from full case space data. On the bottom row, you see the uh, deep learning reconstructed images from undersampled case piece data. You can see that the reconstructions show high quality in this case when there, there's no compression. And here, the images show a uh, degraded quality, excuse me, because that's what we expect from JPEG algorithms, right? The more, the stronger the, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so the more the data is compressed, the, the less good the image is, right? That's clear and that's what we all know from JPEG. So that's expected. But now look at the error. You see the NRMSC in yellow? This error is much lower than this error. Why is that? Why is the error for compressed images lower than for non-compressed images? Why does this error metric say that this image is much better than is this image? Clearly, we can see with our eyes that this image is not better than this one, right? You see all the blurring here? You see the artifacts? We see it. So why do we get a number that says the other thing, the opposite thing, right? Why is that? So let me go back one slide and show you. The reason is that the error metrics measure the quality of the reconstructed image with respect to the gold standard image, but this is not really the gold standard image. It's not the original image. The original image was somewhere here, but we didn't save it, so we don't have access to it. This is the so-called gold standard image, and it is also based on pre-processed data. So both this image and this image are pre-processed. And so what the error metric actually measures is the distance between two pre-processed images. That's not the real quality of the image, of this image. Ideally, we would want to measure the quality of this image with respect to the original image, but we don't have that. It wasn't stored in the database. So what we show here is that using data that was already pre-processed actually makes the error metrics blind. They cannot measure the real quality of the data. And that's another problem with such use. So this was one example. Let's look at some statistical results. So here you see again the same trend. And what I did here was to create four different versions of the FastMRI database. Here there's no compression and here there's uh, various levels of compression and the JPEG compression grows uh, or increases from left to right. And so I optimized trend and tested if every algorithm for every database separately. By the way, this was very time consuming and the computations for this graph and for the previous statistics graph uh, ran for two whole months on 12 GPUs and 200 CPUs. So it was a very extensive set of experiments. Um, but now that it's done, we can look at the results. So let's look at them. You see the error, error versus the pre-processing. And you see the same trend, the graphs reduce with the pre-processing. You see, the more the data is pre-processed, the lower the error becomes. You see that? And so again, this is the bias that we're talking about. And look how strong the bias is. The results could be up to 50% better, misleadingly better. That's not a real implementation of the algorithms by simply uh, working on pre-processed data. And so what we show here in this work is both the bias and we show that error metrics are blind to the pre-processing. They cannot measure the true quality of the image because their benchmark image, the true image was, uh, uh, or the benchmark image that is used for comparison is based, for, based on processed data and the true image was not stored in the database. They don't have access to it. Okay. So after all of this work, we then became interested in the question of how will algorithms perform for clinical data? Let's say that I downloaded a database and I developed my algorithm and I trained and tested it and the algorithm does very well for processed data. How is it going to do for clinical data? Is it going to give us such good performance again? 
So in order to answer this question, what I did was to take the pre-trained networks, which, which were trained on pre-processed data, and then to deploy them twice, I simply did inference twice using processed and non-processed versions of the same database. And here's what you see. Here, uh, this is again a new image from the FastMRI database with uh, two pathologies. And you can see here the results of applying the algorithms to process data. And you can see that the results are very sharp and there's a lot of uh, fine resolution, high resolution details. However, when the same algorithm, the same network that was already trained is now applied to real world data, which we will get if we did this exam in the clinic in, the, in an MRI scanner, you can see the results are blurred. You see, I hope that you can see it over Zoom. Many details are blurred. And in some extreme cases, details that indicate a pathology could completely disappear. And so the doctor will not make an accurate diagnosis based on such images because they don't reflect the original, the true uh, state of the patient. And you can see it here also in this graph, which, which compares the perform uh, performance of the algorithms for processed and non-processed data. So in green, you see the test on processed data. And this is the same as in all the previous slides where the algorithms were, uh, were trained and tested on processed data. And you see again in green that the error reduces with the pre-processing. This is the same thing that we saw in all the previous slides. However, now you can also see the results for clinical real-world data in red. And you see that here the error actually grows, you see? And the reason is that the algorithms that have been trained on pre-processed data are already adapted to pre-processed data. And so they don't produce such good performance or such good results for real world data, they're already adapted to the pre-processing. And what we show here is that there is a performance gap. You see how big the gap is between algorithms that are trained on processed data to those that are trained or tested on non-processed data. And so this is not good news for us because what we show is that if algorithms are trained on processed data in a naive way, they're actually not going to do very well in the clinic when you, you, when you try to deploy them to real world data. And this is an, another reason for why we don't want to train algorithms using data that is not suitable for the reconstruction task. So just to summarize this part or most of the talk, uh, the study reveals that naive use of big data can lead to biased, overly optimistic results of medical AI algorithms. It also shows that canonical algorithms, compressed sensing, deep learning, and dictionary learning are vulnerable to this bias. So this is not a very small problem that is typical of some specific algorithm. This is a very general problem that, uh, and it is relevant to many algorithms. And we also show that these algorithms exhibit poor generalization to real world data. As you, as you saw in the last slide, if they have been uh, trained on processed data, they're not going to do very well for clinical data. And so if you're interested in this work, you're welcome to take a look at our paper, which was recently published in PNAS. And we also give all the code and the pre-trained networks uh, in this link here. Any questions so far? I have a couple of more slides just to show some, some more recent work that is being done in our lab. This is uh, just for fun, if, if we have time. Any questions about uh, this? Yeah, maybe can I, can I ask something? Sure. Um, so, uh, it's nice. I thank you very much for the for the presentation. I'm gonna, even though I cut in halfway, but uh, so you you indeed suggest that the generalization is rather poor, uh, even if you go to real world data. Now, uh, indeed, I can I can see that, especially when you have zero padding, that kind of um, would be rather un, uh, kind of peculiar. But the the effect of of JPEG compression obviously might be much more specific, and, and maybe the Having it trained on kind of sparsified data is not actually that bad somehow. Uh, do, do, have you seen that maybe different artifacts or different pre-processing steps might have different effects on on um, on the kind of general generalizability of your of your of the various methods? Uh, that's a great question. We are, so we only analyzed these two pipelines because, as I said, it was a very huge set of experiment that was required to show the, this effect. Um, we didn't analyze more pipelines at this point, but it's definitely doable. So I'm not sure what would be the results, but it's very interesting because there are many other pre-processing uh, pipelines. I can give you an example. Let's say in dynamic MRI, which I will show in the next few, sl few slides, so, uh, as I said in the beginning, it's impossible to acquire all the data. So let's say we acquire a case-based data with an acceleration of four. 
for example, but we still want to train networks on that. So what do we do? So what a lot of people do is to reconstruct the so-called ground truth images using an algorithm such as Grappauer Sense, which is a, which are both very well known for parallel imaging, and then they treat the Grappauer reco or Sense reconstructions as ground truth, and they train based on that. But the sense reconstruction is not the, 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 the correct, or it may be very good, but it's not the actual image that is down there beneath all the data, right? And so it's possible to analyze what is the effect of using reconstructed images as ground truth for training or as uh, targets for training. And that's one possible extension that we're thinking of for this research. Okay, thanks, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Okay, I'll let you think, and I have uh, three or four more slides. Is that okay? Let's go. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. So, sounds good. So, so all of this was the data crimes research, and I want to show you just a few more uh, things that we are doing at the time, uh, at this time or over the last year, which really relate to efficient computational techniques for dynamic MRI data. And now this is a completely different topic, so let me give you a brief introduction. As we said, dynamic MRI is another problem or a more complicated problem. In dynamic MRI, we're trying to do uh, imaging and reconstructed uh, construction of videos. So dynamic means temporal. We acquire sequences of data along the temporal dimension. And uh, this specific study, which is termed BladeNet, is, uh, is targeted at dynamic imaging of the bowels of the intestine. You can see it here. So this is a lower abdomen slice. It's an axial slice down in the abdomen. And this is a coronal uh, slice. You can see here, the, this is the chest and the abdomen of a, a person. And, the, and what you see is the peristalsis, which is our uh, focus here in the study. Peristalsis is synchronized motion of the intestine. And the reason that we're developing algorithms for that is that by working with clinicians and radiologists from Stanford Children's Hospital, we learned that today there are the techniques that they are used in the clinic for imaging peristalsis and the intestine are very limited. They have limited temporal resolution. And this is related to the MRI limitations that we talked about in the beginning, the slow acquisition, the motion blurring. And here there's another challenge. Peristalsis is not periodic. So in contrast to cardiac imaging and to other types of uh, imaging where there, there is respiration uh, and where algorithms can use the fact that the motion is uh, periodic, both respiration is periodic and cardiac motion is periodic. Here, peristalsis is not periodic. So you cannot assume that there is any period in order to reconstruct the data. So this is a very challenging task. Uh, and that's why we're working on it, it's uh, very interesting. So the aim here is to get good images for free breathing data. What you see here on the left in this video is a breath hold scan. The person was asked to hold their breath to stop breathing. You can see that the abdomen is not moving. However, if we do imaging of children and especially babies, we cannot ask them to stop breathing right for half a minute or a minute, it's too difficult. And so they breathe freely. And therefore the videos look like this. And as you can see, there's a lot of motion here, right? There's respiration, there's peristalsis. Sometimes the person moves, the body moves, and still we need to reconstruct accurate images from this type of data that is acquired in challenging uh, regimes. So how do we do that? So in this research, we develop a technique that is known as, uh, that we termed as BladeNet. This is for rapid dynamic abdominal MRI using propeller and deep learning. So what is propeller here? In, the, uh, in this project, we considered several undersampling schemes. Remember, I told you earlier about the variable density schemes. Now all the undersampling is in one dimension because this is 2D data, two-dimensional data, 2D plus time. So for this type of data, we, could, we can consider three different schemes. Uh, this is Cartesian variable density, where we sample full lines, and here there's variable density across this dimension. We could do radial sampling as this, and we could also do propeller. The reason that we focused on propeller is that this uh, sampling and this sampling produces incoherent artifacts that cover the entire image, but propeller does not produce such artifacts. Propeller simply produces low resolution images in this dimension. We have full resolution here along the fully sampled dimension and low resolution along this. So I didn't say that, but every color here shows a different blade. It's called the blade. So propeller acquires blades and the blades rotate with time. And every blade gives us a low resolution image. Now, the reason we decided to use this is because Propeller offers fast sampling. 
And also built-in motion correction because there is a repetitive uh, sampling of case space center, as you can see here. This is very useful for motion correction. So these are the, the benefits of propeller. Local only artifacts, there are no global ones, alias free images and built-in motion correction. And so how do we solve this reconstruction problem here? What we do is to acquire the data using a propeller scheme. So again, it rotates with time in case space. So we get all these case space blades, which you see here. Then we apply the non-uniform fast rate ones from to them to get images. So in contrast to a well-known uh, method that was developed in 1999, where all the data is acquired for and accumulated over five frames, uh, here we use every frame separately. So every frame is going, to, every frame or every blade is going to have different artifacts, different lower resolution axes because the frames, uh, the sampling rotates with time. And in this project, what we what we do is to take the single blade images, we feed all of them to a neural network, and the network performs sequence to sequence mapping. It learns to reconstruct a high resolution set of images from this low resolution input. And the reason that we uh, show or why it is able to do that is because there, the, the, there is high resolution here along one dimension and the blurring dimension rotates with time. And also uh, there's redundancy of information. So the network is able to pick up areas uh, in which they're sharp, in time frames in which they're sharp and use them for the final reconstructions. It, it looks at all the data across the temporal dimension. It is able to recover the fine details. Let me show you some quick results without going into all the technical details due to the time limitation. So here are some results. What you see here on the left column is the input to the network. This is the magnitude image and this is the phase image. Remember we said that MRI data is complex valued. And so you see that the input is very blurred. This is what we get from the propeller sampling. And you can also see that the blurring rotation, blurring dimension rotates with time. However, this is the blade net reconstruction. This is our approach. And you can see that it reconstructs high resolution details from this blurred input. And here you can compare it with the target, which is a fully sampled. See, and hopefully you can see that this reconstruction, reconstructions are very accurate. And because this is video, you also see the temporal dimension. So what we show is by using the combination of propeller sampling and the machine learning reconstruction, we are able to recover high resolution videos in, with, where there's high resolution in space and time, uh, uh, and which is highly, uh, has high fidelity to the fully sampled ground truth. And uh, if you're interested in this method, then uh, we published an abstract about it in the ISMRM this year, and uh, excuse me, the abstract is available online. We're still working on it, but so there will be more to come this year. Okay, let me just say a quick thanks to the people who contributed a lot to the data crimes research. Uh, first of all, my advisor for me uh, from Berkeley, Mickey Lustig, and uh, my colleague, Kerr Wang, who is a PhD student in Mickey's lab, and my colleague, John Tamir, who used to be a postdoc in our lab and is now faculty at UT Austin. And so that's it. And thank you everybody for your time and attention. I'd be happy to answer questions.